Well, hey, we started a, a, a series called Substance last week, and uh, I'm excited to continue this. In, and the tagline for this series is this, is more than believing. Substance, more than believing. And, and what we're looking at is when we strip back our faith, we look at the things underneath, the foundations of things, um, what lies underneath our faith. Last week we talked about the word faith in, in Hebrews and we talked about the verse that faith is the substance, right? And so I gave you this definition of the word substance last week. The dictionary defines it like this. It says uh, substance is the real physical matter of which a person or a thing consists and which has tangible and solid presence. But I gave you my definition um, and I redefined it for us for this series. So my definition of the word substance is this. Substance is what we cannot see that gives value, meaning, and purpose to that which we can see. Sub substance is, is what we cannot see, but it gives value, meaning, and purpose to that which we can see. And what I challenge us as we go into this new year is we question and, and look at our faith, the substance of our faith. I don't want to be people that just say we believe. I don't want to be people that just speak more than we act. Uh, when people peel back the fabric of our lives and they see the character that lies underneath you and me, I hope that they see a faith. They see something of substance. And I, I was telling you guys that, that at the end of it, we all really want to be people of substance. When it comes to faith, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to anything that matters, there should be something of substance underneath. And, and so we talked about faith last week, and uh, this week I want to talk about this word uh, truth. Someone say truth. truth. Now uh, today, uh, truth is not something that's as valued as it once was. Um, I don't know if you have learned that, um, but opinions are the currency of the day. In this world today, we, we buy, we sell, we trade opinions. And uh, it's a shift culturally from where the world used to be. Um, now, I haven't grown up through all the generations, but if you go far enough back in time, uh, you were valued based on who you belonged to. Right, our, our value it came from the family you belong to, the family name, the history, the legacy of a family. And you'd say, I'm the son of, of so-and-so. And that's how we measured value. Well, you fast forward through the, the generations and the industrial revolution, and it became all about what you could produce. And, and our value was based on what you could do, what you could produce. Uh, my name's this, and this is what I do. And, and we've continued some of that into today's generation, but today's generation uh, is a generation of opinions. And you're valued by what you think. You're valued by what you, you think about a certain thing. And people will come to you all the time, well, what's your opinion about such and such, right? Some of you guys just got through Thanksgiving, so you're like, please don't bring this up to me, uh, right? And there's different opinions around the table, right? But, but today, opinions are currency, but the substance of our faith is truth. And so I want to spend some time this morning and talk about this word truth. And I want to start in the book of 1 Corinthians, in this passage in chapter 3. It says, but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one that we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value if the work survives, the builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Don't you realize that you together are the temple of God, that the Holy Spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Stop deceiving yourselves. If you think you are wise by this world's standards, then you need to become a fool to be truly wise, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. 
I like this part. It says, uh, like one barely escaping the flames. It, the, the work, if it doesn't have value, it'll be burned up. And, and you might make it, but you're going to barely make it escape through the flames. And, and if there's anything opposite of what I want to teach this morning, it is that. I, I don't want to get to the end and be someone that, that barely made it by escaping the flames. I, I want to be someone that the life that I built, the foundation I built upon, is something that lasts And to do that, we have to question, we have to look at our life and our faith and say, what is the substance underneath? And so this morning, I want to talk to you about truth. And and truth is is funny because um, today, a lot of people will disregard truth for the sake of their own opinion. We disregard truth for the sake of our opinion. Here's the the danger for you and me today. The, The danger is that you can do that. You're totally legal. There's nothing against it. You can disregard truth all day long for the sake of your own opinion. The problem is our, the world we live in will actually even congratulate you for this, and they will applaud you for it, and they will agree with you that, that it's okay. The, the only truth that really exists today is that you can define your own truth. And, and the problem with opinions is if you search far enough, eventually uh, you'll find someone that will agree with you. Right? Uh, so Grady and I, we watched, uh, there's a, a movie from the 90s that was kind of a big deal. It's called The Matrix. Uh, there's a new Matrix out now. And uh, yeah, some of you guys are like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, this is awesome. Okay, so uh, I'm about to break your heart. Uh, so this is where I lost Grady. So I've never seen The Matrix. And so, oh, yeah, some of you guys are like, this guy's our pastor. Come on. Uh, so i never seen it, so we went and we watched it the other day. I said, I need to see what that movie's all about. So we watched it, and he's like, man, it was just the greatest movie of all time. And I was like, oh, I was like, it's horrible. Like, and he's like, oh, but the stuff they were doing was like cutting edge. And I was like, yeah, but I mean, even then, it's horrible. Like, the script wasn't that great. The acting wasn't that great. Uh, the new one's good because the guy has a beard. Uh, but I just, I don't know. You know, any guy who wears a trench coat and walks around in all black suit, I don't know. It just, it wasn't, he's like, oh, it's so realistic. I was like, really? The fire does not look like fire. Like, it's, I don't know. So we got in a big argument. Um, but uh, how many know if I search far enough, how many guys don't like the Matrix? It just it wasn't, oh, thanks. See, if I look far enough, I can find some people that agree with me. Uh, so if you do me a favor, after service today, let Grady know it was a horrible film, and uh, you should never watch it. Uh, so... The problem is we'll throw away truth for the sake of our our own opinions, and oftentimes what we do is uh, we will separate ourselves from people who disagree with us, and and we will find environments and find people who will agree with us, and um, and, and we have to be careful in in doing this uh, because sometimes we actually sacrifice truth in the process, And, and just because we believe something to be true doesn't make it true. That's why truth is, is substance, because it's unchanging. And, and there's a book that I'm reading right now. It's called uh, Live No Lies. It's by a, a writer, a Christian author. His name's John Mark Comer. And uh, he says this. He says, the problem is not so much that we live lies, but that we, or it's not so much that we tell lies, but that we live them. The problem isn't that we tell lies, it's that we live them. And, and we can disillusion our thinking and side so much with our opinions that eventually we live as if these things are truth. And in the process, we, we believe and we live our lives from our own deception. And so the quote that he says is, just because something feels good doesn't mean it is good. And if there's anything we should not do, it's whatever we want. I want to read it again because that one was good. Just because something feels good doesn't mean it is good. If there's anything we should not do, it's whatever we want. Have you ever gotten in trouble for doing the thing that you wanted that you knew you weren't supposed to do in the first place? There was a a study on a podcast I was listening to, and uh, these scientists were doing these studies on monkeys, on chimpanzees. And, um, And so they found out that monkeys have a personality. And um, so they, they went into the jungle, they found a tribe of monkeys, and um, if they studied the monkeys long enough, they found that each of them had personalities. And uh, most of them were the typical monkeys you'd think of swinging from the, the branches and jumping all over the place, having a good time and party, right? Those are my kind of animals. Uh, and, then, uh, and, and then 
they, they found in every tribe of monkeys, uh, there were some of them that, that had a worrying, anxiety-conscious personality, that were always stressed out, that were always just cautious about everything. They didn't seem to go with the flow of everyone else. I see you guys laughing at each other over there. Uh, it's okay. That's how my marriage works, too. So, um, so they, they did an experiment, and, uh, and they said, we're going to um, go into this tribe of monkeys, and we're going to extract out all of the monkeys that have a fearful, worrying, anxious conscience, and we're just going to remove them from the tribe. And we're going to leave the rest of them for a year, uh, and then we'll come back in a year to see what happens. And you want to know what happened a year later when they came back to that tribe of monkeys? There was no tribe of monkeys. Uh, because the, the ones that would have been fearful or cautious and warned the others of oncoming predators uh, were not to be found. And, and so the ones that lived in ignorant bliss and had a great time, they got eaten. And... Um, it, see, the, the problem that I have, I don't know if you have, but we tend to surround ourselves with people who agree with us, and, and really we'd probably do a lot better if we found people who disagreed with us and had differing opinions so we could sort things out. But our, our natural tendency is to distance ourselves from people who disagree with us and surround ourselves with people who do. And, and in danger, we, we sacrifice truth. And so my main point today is this, is that truth does not bend for the validation of opinion. If truth can bend, and maybe you've, you've heard this, oh, you know, it wasn't a lie, it was like a half truth. You know, I just, I bent the truth a little bit. If you can bend it, it's not truth. Because truth doesn't bend. And the substance of our faith is truth. Truth does not bend for the validation of our opinions. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 says, Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds his house on solid rock. Though the rain comes and the torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey is foolish like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. The problem with sinking ourselves with our opinions and holding so tightly to our opinions uh, is that opinions seek validation. And so I can decept myself into believing something to be truth if I find enough people that agree with me, right? And, and just because everybody agrees with you doesn't actually make something truth. And, and the problem of our world today is there's so many, quote, truths that are being accepted that aren't really truth. But because everyone believes the same, we think that, that they're truth. But there's, there's only one source of truth, and it's the word of God. And truth does not bend for the validation of our feelings or our opinions. The substance of our faith is, is truth. And uh, I was thinking about this. Uh, it reminds me of, uh, there's a film, I'm talking about a lot of films today. Um, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. I almost said the Pirates Who Can't Do Anything. That's uh, the Christian version of the film. Um, <laughs> so the, the, the whole series, Jack Sparrow, he has this compass, right? And uh, if you've seen the film, uh, everyone makes fun of his compass because his compass can't point north. And he said, what good is a compass that doesn't point north? And um, he says it doesn't need to because for him, his compass, it points wherever uh, his desires lead him. The thing he desires most is where the, point, uh, the compass points to, Right? And he has no problem finding his way to the desires of his heart, the place he wants to get to, because if he desires it, that's where the, the compass points, right? But eventually, uh, you need something to point you north, to know what straight is. And if we surround ourselves with, with people who share the same opinion as us, uh, and everything's based on opinion, and there's no substance of truth, you're going to have a hard time pointing yourself north. And I love that quote from John Mark Comer that if there's anything we shouldn't do, it's the, the thing uh, that we want. If it's the desire of your heart, you should take caution to it because in James 1.14, this is what it says, is that temptation comes from our own desires, 
which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful action, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Our human condition is to be led by our desires rather than by truth. And the the scary thing is we're allowed to do this. We're allowed to indulge the flesh. We're allowed to indulge our selfish desires. But if we follow our desires, our desires will lead us to death. In Genesis 3, chapter 1, the the serpent is in the garden. He comes to Eve and um, and he says this, "The, the serpent was shrewder than any animal in the field that God had made. So it said to the woman, did God really say that you must not eat from the trees of the garden? Here's the problem. That's exactly what God said. It's exactly what God said. But the Bible says that the the devil, he's the father of lies. The devil works through deception. And um, there's another quote in this book I'm reading right now. And he said, if the devil uh, died tomorrow you would still sin tomorrow. If the devil didn't exist tomorrow, you would still sin because temptation, it comes from our own desires. And what the devil does is he plays to the desires of our flesh. He presents deception, but we're the ones that, that take a hold of it. Why? Because we, we want it. My old pastor, uh, I love, he had this saying, he'd say, the reason you sin is because you like it. <laughs> the reason you sin is because you like it. Uh, The things that we indulge in, the things that we know that we're not supposed to do, that we grab a hold of, we grab a hold of because we want them. If we didn't, we wouldn't grab a hold of them. And and so uh, the temptation is to follow our opinion, to follow our flesh, to follow the desires of our heart rather than searching for truth. And and so truth is not a matter of opinion. Truth is, is unchanging, which means we have to come into alignment with it. A lot of ourselves don't live in alignment with it, but truth will not bend for the sake of your opinion of what you want truth to be. Truth is truth, and it comes from the the very word and the mouth of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong with our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong, and it teaches us to do what is right. See, we hold the Bible as truth. And not only truth, but the Bible is authoritative. It's authoritative truth. Why? Because God is the author of all scripture. And so truth comes from the mouth of God. Truth comes from the word of God. And truth is God. You want to peel back substance underneath. Substance is the truth of the word of God. And truth, it doesn't bend for the sake of our, our own opinions or our own desires. It, it actually, it teaches us what's wrong with our lives. And it teaches us to do what is right. And so the thing is that we must come into alignment with truth. And to be people of substance, we need to be people that live by truth. And the problem is, is that today, truth isn't valued as something that's unchanging. Truth is something that that really has lost its value because you can define what it is. And if I can define what my own truth is, then I can do whatever I want. Really, it's the ultimate sin that was from the beginning. All sin really comes back to this, this desire of ours to play God. And what we're doing is saying, God, uh, I'm going to take into my own hands the ability to define right and wrong. And if I can define right and wrong, then nobody can judge me, right? There's a, it just came to me, it's really funny. There's a secular artist and, um, uh, this, sorry, this plays on two movies, so you're going to have to have some, some street cred to know what I'm talking about. But um, <laughs> have you guys seen The Princess Bride and Inigo Montoya, You Kill My Father, Prepare to Die? Right, uh, there's a line in that movie, and he says, I don't think that means what you think it means. Uh, well, there's a song by a secular artist, and uh, the song's all about just getting drunk and partying and just everything crazy. And um, she has a line after all that. She says, don't worry about it because only God can judge us. Uh, someone made a meme about it and put Inigo Montoya there after. And he said, I don't, I don't think that means what you think it means. Uh, 
See, the, the problem is if we take truth into our own hands and truth is something that can bend, truth is something that can be redefined and misdefined, um, then we become God. And, and actually, we like this. Because if, if I'm God, then I don't have to walk in conviction. I don't have to walk in. I can claim to be the straightest person uh, and everyone else needs to redefine their lives based on the way that I live mine. And, and this is what we're doing today is, is that if I can get enough people to agree with me, then I can deceive myself into believing that, that what I'm living is actually truth. But in Corinthians, as we read earlier, it said, stop deceiving yourselves. For if you think you're wise by the world's standards, then you need to become a fool. Why? Because the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. The idea that you and I can determine what truth is for ourselves is utter foolishness, God defines it as. And so the problem is that truth is, is unbendable. Truth is level. Truth is the marker that which we must align ourselves with. And uh, man, I don't know if you're good at building things or you're not good at building things, but even the best of builders need one of these things. Right, because this is what tells me and determines that, that what I'm standing on is level, is, is straight. And, and the problem is when we, we ditch truth, we compare ourselves to the people around us. And, and how many of you know I can look pretty straight next to the person to the left or my right? <laughs> right? When, when I take truth into my own hands and I say, yeah, I think that's, that's a straight line, you know, because everything's relativity. So, so next to Robert, right, I, I'm, I'm pretty straight, right? Or, or next to, you know, name fill in the blank, next to that person. And the problem is, is we've allowed this to slip into the church uh, because uh, this is what the religious leaders of Jesus' day did. Because they viewed themselves so much higher than everyone else, because they lived by such a high standard, they could look upon other people and say, yeah, but compared to them, right? And, and Grady and I, we were actually, we were building this platform behind us this week, and uh, if you look, the boards get a little more crooked as they go, uh, because we stood one up, and rather than keeping things level, we just leveled it next to the thing that was after it. And progressively, things got further and further out of alignment. And this is what we do with our lives, is we compare ourselves to the truths of others. We compare ourselves to the lives of other people. The problem is, in the end, we will not be measured by the person to our left or our right, but we'll be measured by the truth of God's word, which is unchanging, which is unbending. And no matter how good of a person you think you are or I think I am, we have to know that in the end, truth is the measuring stick by which our lives will be evaluated. God's going to come and he's going he's gonna to test. And uh, it said that, that with fire, it's going to burn up the foundation. And what is left will reveal the work that each of us has done. And so we have to come into alignment with truth because it's the measuring stick of which God evaluates the way that you and I are to live. Anything other than that is, is us living our own truth, is us defining what we want to be right and wrong. And uh, man, I could play games all day and I could be way better than the rest of you if, uh, if I get to define what's right and wrong. Right, Because I can find enough people that agree with me, that encourage me in my lifestyle and the way that I want to live. But in the end, there comes a judgment, and I'm not going to be judged by my own truth. I'm going to be judged by the, the unchanging truth, which is the word of God. In uh, 1 Corinthians 2.13, it says, When we tell you these things, we did not use words that came from human wisdom, Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's word to explain spiritual truths. But people who are not spiritual cannot receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they cannot understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. Those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. For who can know the Lord's thoughts and who knows enough to teach him? 
But we understand these things because we have the mind of Christ. Who knows enough to teach him? The problem is we think all the time that we're, we're somehow going to show God something that he's never thought of before. We're somehow going to give him a loophole. Well, you know, when you wrote it, that was years ago, right? And uh, I, I don't think you knew about the times that we're living in today. Uh, I don't think you, you knew future where this might lead to, God. But um, no, who can know the mind of God? Because his ways are so much higher than ours. I love in Jeremiah, it says, this is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans who rely on human strength, and they turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are stunted like shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future, and they will live in a barren wilderness that is uninhabited in a salty land. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by the long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and never stop producing fruit. But the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord... Search all hearts and examine secret motives. And I will give people their due rewards according to their actions, what they deserve. See, I can fool myself and deceive myself into thinking that I'm living right, that I'm living in a way that won't cause myself or cause others harm. But Jeremiah says that the human heart is the most deceitful of all things. And it's a scary place to be when we can deceive ourselves into believing that we're living truth when really all we're doing is is seeking validation from our own opinion. We're seeking validation for the way that we live. We're trying to find loopholes. Uh, Man, it's a scary thing, but there's actually people today rewriting the Bible um, and claiming it to be the Bible, but they're taking out the pieces of the things that they don't want to align with. Uh, which scares me, yeah, I know, Greg's shaking his head. What scares me the most is um, <laughs> we're going through a study in Revelation right now, and, um, and it says, to he who adds to this or takes away, right? It, and, man, there's something coming for those of us that take away from the word of God, and we would say, God, you know, we're not okay with your truth, but we're going to redefine truth to find validation for the way that, that we want to live. And people don't like truth, and and if we're honest, we don't either, uh, because truth does something. Truth brings conviction. Someone say conviction. And uh, conviction can sound scary, um, but conviction is actually one of my my most favorite things to preach on, uh, because it's so commonly misunderstood. God didn't come to condemn the world, but he came to, to save the world through his son, Jesus Christ. And uh, sometimes we get condemnation confused with conviction. The problem is if we ignore conviction long enough, it might lead us into condemnation. But that's not what God came with. The Holy Spirit, he convicts us of all truth. And and so truth convicts. And the problem is we we don't like the feeling of conviction. Uh, You know, you straighten out a nail or you straighten out a board. There's a pressure that has to be put to straighten something out. And uh, some of you guys have children, so this is a really funny analogy, right? Uh, but, but conviction is not fun when we have to come into alignment. We have to be straightened out. We have to be brought back to what is level of truth. And, and truth brings conviction. And, and my encouragement is not to run from conviction because it's an opportunity for correction. Conviction is the Holy Spirit pointing out something that's wrong so that you and I have the opportunity to make it right. It's actually an act of love that that God would take his measuring stick on you, and he'd say, yeah, that's not quite straight. It's just a little bit off. But but I'm going to measure you by my righteousness and not your own. 
And I need you to, to straighten and come into alignment with the truth of my word. So conviction is it's the Holy Spirit pointing out something that's wrong so that you have the opportunity to make it right. And it's an act of love. But if we run away from conviction, the Holy Spirit will, will disown us to our own desires. It talks about this in the book of Romans. And it said that they, they wanted to continue to dream up new ways of sinning. And so God left them in their sin. And he left them to do the things that they wanted to do. You know, Adam and Eve didn't have to take from the fruit, but they made a choice to take from it. We, we choose our own truth, and when we do that, we have to recognize that at some point or another, God's going to come to straighten us out. And we can do it in this life, or we can do it in the next, but man, I warn you not to do it in the next. And, and when conviction comes, it's, it's actually an act of love that the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, I'm giving you an opportunity to straighten things out here to make it right. Because I love you, and I care about you, and I know what's best for you. And if you continue to define what is straight by the world's standards, if you continue to define what is truth by the world's standards, and you continue to measure yourself, gradually you're going to fall more and more out of alignment of the will and the plan and the purposes that I have for your life. But if you come to my word and you, you plant yourself in me, then I'm going to bring correction and um, this actually happens in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 12. And uh, it's uh, King David. And some of you guys know this story. But uh, David finds himself in a messy situation. And David has his runaway from what he knows to be right. And he's living in this sin. And so God sends a prophet to him. And it says, so the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David this story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle, but the poor man owned nothing but one little lamb that he had bought. He raised that little lamb. Oh, I lost my spot. I'm coming back. The poor man owned nothing but the little lamb that he had bought. He raised the little lamb, and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day, a guest arrived to the home of the rich man, but instead of killing the animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guests. David was furious, as surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one that he stole and for having no pity. Then David said, or then Nathan said to David, you are that man. The Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you to be king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wife's in the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you so much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? See, all of a sudden, we, we feel like we have the right to measure things when we look at the person to the left or the right of us. This man takes this other man's sheep and he says, oh man, he deserves to die. But when he's looking at his own life, he says, well, I can judge myself a little bit differently. I can determine for myself my own truth. But the word of the Lord comes to David and he says, David, you are that man. You, you're living in this sin and you're blind to it because you've surrounded yourself with people that are going to encourage you and say yes to you and pat you on the back and, and, and uplift you in the poor decisions that you're making. But I don't judge you by the acceptance of others. I judge you by the measurement of my own truth. And David, what you did was wrong. And so I'm going to bring correction. I'm going to bring conviction so that right here and now we can set it straight. We can make it right so that you can continue to reign over this nation in the way that I've destined for you. You can continue to walk in my blessing that I have for you. 
or you can ignore this conviction and you can continue to live the way which you want. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is inspired by God and it's useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong with our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and it teaches us to do what is right. So to live a life of substance, we have to be people that live by truth. And, and truth is not granted for you and I to define. Truth does not bend. And if it can bend, know this morning that it's not truth. And, and for you and for me, I want us to be people that welcome the conviction of the Holy Spirit to recognize that it's actually a sign that, that God has marked us with his spirit and that he loves us enough to point out the things that are wrong so that you and I can make them right. But oftentimes we want to ignore the voice of the Holy Spirit. We want to run away from the Holy Spirit and we miss out on the blessing that God has for us because we'd rather live life the way that we want to live it. And, and the dangerous thing is that you and I have every opportunity to do this and no one's going to correct you for it. I, I love when the Holy Spirit corrects me. Um, sometimes um, that voice comes through other people, like the prophet Nathan. Sometimes it, it comes in moments when I'm reading the word. But I'm glad that God loves me enough not to allow me to make whatever decision I want to make. Because if I did, I, I would find myself in the end like one barely escaping through the flames. But, but God says there's no other foundation that's been laid than that of Jesus Christ. And you build your life on this. Let me be the cornerstone. And don't define yourself by the board to the left or to the right, but define yourself by the cornerstone, by the truth, by the one that, that is straight. Jesus said he's on the way, the truth, and the life. But he said many don't find that path. And the ones that find that path are the ones that submit themselves to the Holy Spirit and they allow conviction, and they respond to correction, and they come into alignment with the Word of God so that they can live the life that He's destined for them. And, um, man, there's too many people today that, that are a horrible representation of what the truth of this book really is because we've redefined it by our own terms and our own standards. And what I've learned is that people don't actually buy into the package, when, when people see us redefining truth and living our own version of faith and Christianity, people don't buy into the package because they say it's not much different than the way that, that I'm living my life. It, wh why would I want that when it doesn't look any different than what I have over here? But when they see the blessing that comes by those of us that choose to stand on truth, that choose to align ourselves with truth, and we live by the word of God, those are people of substance, the people that live by faith, the people that live by truth. And um, today, the, the response is really simple, is that you and I would choose to be people that live by truth. And, and we would be people that, that we don't ignore truth, but we would get this truth into our hearts. Because uh, the opposite of truth is deception, and it's the, the weapon of the enemy and Jesus gets sent into the wilderness, and he's tempted, and he responds with truth. And, and he corrects the deception, and he says, but the word of the Lord says. We live our lives by truth, and the way we correct the deception is by knowing what the truth is. But until we get the truth inside of us, we'll always buy into the deception we're always going to be led by the desire of our flesh to want to do the things that we want to do. Why? Because we, we like it. But the Spirit, I read this first a couple weeks ago in Philippians, is working in us, giving us the desire and the power to do the things that please Him. And so if we're people of truth, then God, His Holy Spirit, ignites truth in our lives and our, our minds and our hearts are open to it. People of this world, in that passage we read a little bit ago, says they're blind to it. They don't know truth. But we came to you through the Spirit and with words of the Spirit because the Spirit is the one who reveals truth. And so today I want to pray for us that, that we would receive the Spirit of truth this morning. But 
in that receiving, the spirit of truth may bring a conviction. And my prayer for you is that you wouldn't run from the conviction, but you would recognize that it's the Holy Spirit drawing you to himself. And it's the Holy Spirit bringing you into correction so that you can live the life that he's purposed for you. So that you wouldn't get away in the end like one escaping the flames, but your life would be built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. Amen? Just join me this morning. I want to pray over you. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your spirit. God, in a world where we examine the, the lives of people around us and so many times it can feel so empty, uh, God, even our own lives, we can choose to live in a way where we say the right things and we do the right things and we go to church every Sunday, but God, we leave this place feeling empty because there isn't a substance underneath. But God, today, I pray that that wouldn't be true of us, but today, God, we would live as people of truth. We would live as people of faith, people of substance. God, that you would fill us with truth. And not only that, God, we would fill ourselves with truth. We wouldn't deny this gift of your word that you've given us, but God, we would, as David said, hide your word within our hearts so that we wouldn't sin against you, Jesus. God, would we get truth deep inside and would your Holy Spirit reveal that and God, as you bring conviction, would we respond to it with, with uh, God, repentance? We come before you and, God, ask for forgiveness and you would straighten us out because, God, your plan, your, your word says that you came to give life and to give life to the full. And we miss out on that when we surrender truth for the sake of our own opinion, the own validation of the way that we want to live. But God, you've called us to a higher standard. You've called us to a, a higher level of obedience because your spirit desires the things that are good and pleasing and perfect for us. And so God, would we submit ourselves to your truth, to your spirit today, and would we be people that live by it? And God, as people see truth in our lives, we see truth on display. God, would people want to come into alignment with that? Would they question the life that we live and say, how do you live in such a way? And God, would they know that it's you working through us, it's your spirit living in us, it's only by your word and by your truth. And God, maybe we never be people that substitute truth, that rewrite the words of scripture to align with ourselves, but God, would you, you bring us into alignment with your truth because it doesn't bend. God, would you be the standard for our lives and would we be called up today to live according to that? Jesus, we thank you for your presence. I just pray a blessing over those here today. God, would your spirit just leave this place with us today and uh, God, enable us to live in a way that honors and pleases you. In your name we pray, amen.